So thank you, Anna. I will just uh, briefly do an introduction and then I will give you uh, an online floor, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, I'm Vanna Brahmashuli. I represent Caucasian House. We are uh, delighted to have you today on uh, the discussion. Um, uh, basically, for the audience, I want to introduce uh, our speaker, Anna Rukumian. Uh, she's a well-known uh, journalist, writer, uh, independent analy uh, analyst right now. She has worked uh, for USA Today, uh, for International Crisis Group, many other uh, organizations. Uh, she's also author of a famous uh, book, which came out in 2014, The Putin's Mystic. Uh, so um, I urge you to look uh, into that as well. And um, today we'll be speaking uh, and discussing the constitutional amendments in Russia. Basically, it was uh, planned, um, it was announced uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, however, due to the COVID-19, uh, Russia was only able to hold the referendum uh, just five days ago on July 1st. Um, so, uh, Anna, I saw actually a couple of your analysis on that regard. The latest one I have seen was that on the uh, Moscow Times, you were discussing actually the uh, the two purposes of these constitutional changes. Maybe you could uh, first of all kind of discuss um, what the changes were, how they were packaged, uh, because we know that it was packaged uh, not only uh, so that uh, people would only think it was something uh, that um, ultimately uh, increasing Putin's powers, but something like packaged into like social kind of uh, reforms as well, or like constitutional changes as well. So you know, maybe a little bit on that, as well as on the grand strategy of those changes. Uh, I think since we have one speaker, um, maybe 30 minutes will be yours, and then we move to, to Q&A. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, for listening to me. This is uh, this is great. Um, I really look forward to your questions and comments. Um, I think it'll be a very interesting exchange. Um, uh, so I'll uh, I'd like to begin with um, I guess explaining uh, what 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 what's basically happening. What this is, and I think there are two main questions. Um, about this constitutional, this massive constitutional reform that's uh, taken place. Uh, the first is what is the intent um, of this reform? And the second is what is going to be the effect? And these are two entirely different things. Um, now, the first question of um, intent, that's a very difficult one to gauge because uh, when we talk about intent, we very often assume that we know what, what it's going to be. We assume that the effect of an action is, in fact, the intent of that action. In, in other words, the person who is doing something, we think that this is what he wants to do because that's what the effect is going to be. Uh, that assumes a very, uh, I would say, the idea of a person and his behavior and his motivations as, as somebody acting in a vacuum, whose actions are always streamlined, who knows what he wants, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, uh, able to plan ahead, uh, it does not take into account or mitigate for the fact that a person can be wrong, the fact that a person can miscalculate, the fact that a person might not know what he wants or thinks he wants one thing when he actually wants something entirely different. And I think all of these things really point to Vladimir Putin. Uh, Vladimir Putin is intelligent, uh, an intelligent enough statesman to project an image uh, of somebody who's extremely uh, tactical, flexible, powerful, uh, and in some ways even all-knowing. Um, but at the same time, over the course of his tenure, uh, the fact of the matter is this is not quite the case. And um, so I think that there's a key, uh, I guess there's, there's a tension between our assumption of what he wants with, these, um, with this reform uh, 
and the reality of what he actually wants. And I think that's what I want to kind of focus on in the beginning before we then get into COVID and how he has adapted uh, this reform to the situation as it's, as it's been developing. Um, now, the first basic assumption uh, that we see commentators uh, jumping to, uh, and it's not entirely wrong, um, but that assumption basically states that Putin wants to remain president indefinitely. Um, this ascribes to Putin um, the role of a classical dictator who is going to do anything uh, within his means or beyond his means to hold on to power uh, for as long as possible. Um, there is reason for this. Uh, mainly the reason has been is that he's stayed in power for so long and he has orchestrated um, and um, manipulated the laws in order to ensure uh, his remain in power. Uh, that is by all means absolutely the case. Does that actually mean that Putin wants with all his heart to remain president for life? And here all the evidence is the actual evidence, what we can know um, about what's going on in his head based on what he says, what he's done in the past is we don't know this for sure. And um, in this regard, I want to raise what might be a slightly controversial point, um, and yet one that I'm going to go out on a limb and try to make and explain. Um, in this assumption that Putin wants to stay in power, um, the logic of that basic reality is that Putin is an autocrat. Now, in all, for all intents and purposes, he is. This is uh, surely an autocratic regime. Um, it has elements of a uh, democratic facade, depending on which period you look at. But, you know, basically speaking, we're not really dealing with a real democracy. At the same time, we tend to often assume that just because that is the case, that that's because Putin himself sees himself as an autocrat. That might not be true. Uh, now, if I've been looking at statements, the way Putin uses the word democracy, uses the word democrat. And let's imagine that Putin actually believes himself to be, in a way, a democrat. Now, what kind of democrat does he believe himself to be? And is that an actual does that actually correspond to reality? It's an entirely different question. Um, but the way he sees his role, the way uh, the, 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 uh, the frequency with which he uses the word democracy uh, suggests that this is something he genuinely buys into, or at least he's been saying it for so long um, that he has now he 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 now believes in this uh, in this facade that he's been trying to create. Um, so next is I mean the caveats of that. What does it mean when if if, if we're to suggest that Putin considers himself a democrat? Um, why, if that's the case, has he gone out of his way to stifle the opposition, uh, to engineer uh, a legislative system that um, allows for some pluralism, but basically ensures that there's a systemic opposition, in quotes, that basically parrots the government line? What is, what is the reasoning here? Um, now, if you look at Putin's 20-year tenure, that's, that's, that's a lot of different, um, let's say, in Russian, a lot of um, different roles um, that have often changed. Now, we began with uh, Putin, who was, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, who was very much about the dictatorship of the law in the service of democracy as he saw it. Uh, to do so, his first, uh, some of his first actions were to get rid of the um, competition. Uh, in his mind, does that um, 
negate his idea of democracy? Well, not, not in spirit, no. I mean, the way he would rationalize it is that, well, I'm a Democrat and all of these people just want to bring us back into the 90s and uh, I can't let that happen because I'm a grantor of the Constitution and it is my uh, God-given responsibility to uphold democracy. So that is what I'm doing in the name of democracy. Over time, we saw an increasing um, maybe disappointment, disillusionment with uh, the kind of pro-Western leanings, the kind of pro-Western democracy that uh, the liberals that had surrounded Putin and in, in, in some way had brought him to power uh, that they espoused. Um, Putin saw that, and, and the government elites saw in, in the first half of, the, uh, of, his, of his term, uh, that uh, the West, the way they perceived it, that they, they felt betrayed by the West, primarily NATO expansion um, and the like. They came to see democracy, or Western-style democracy, as something that's not really... Um, True to uh, true to its spirit. What to do? Um, in Russia's case, what emerged to justify to bridge that gap was the concept was a very vague and very convoluted concept of sovereign democracy, and um, so essentially democracy as we like it. Uh, this was uh, something constructed by uh, Kremlin aide and in some ways great cardinal Vladislav Surkov, um, and this concept lived on until about 2012. Um, this concept uh, is interesting because if we look at what happened uh, between, let's say, 2006 and 2012, is that we saw Putin step down from the presidential post um, and assume the post of prime minister. Despite being asked to change the constitution to allow him to uh, run uh, beyond the two uh, presidential term limits, he refused. Um, and then what we saw, as I uh, as I wrote this, this led to um, a lot of uh, infighting, a lot of uncertainty. Ultimately, he uh, settled on a successor, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, who was uh, promoted as a reformer, who was somebody who was going to uh, make democracy actually happen in the way that they saw it. Um, who was going to, who, who, who reformed the police or tried to, uh, who was very tech savvy, who sought to um, repair relations with the West. I mean, all sorts of nice, wonderful things. It didn't work out. Um, it didn't work out and Putin returned to the presidency. The way he uh, explained it was that this was a decision that they had settled on long ago. Um, so I think that that precedent of Putin actually not just saying that he, ref he will not change the constitution to allow him to run for uh, president indefinitely, but actually stepping down in 2008 uh, says a lot about what he thought he wanted. Now, let's go, let's fast forward to now. Uh, January 2020. Um, now this is before COVID, uh, but we are seeing a Russia that uh, in which the elites are becoming increasingly antsy uh, and uncertain about how, what, what, where are we actually going? The fatigue, the, the, the initial euphoria of uh, the annexation of Crimea, which bolstered Putin's popularity, uh, had, by, had by this point turned into fatigue. Uh, the economy, which was never really robust after 2014, uh, continued to stagnate. Um, the idea of, okay, what, what next really wasn't, wasn't making a lot of sense. Um, in 2018, uh, Putin again held an, an election and, and won, and now there's the sense of, okay, well now what, another six years, but what about afterwards? Uh, the more these questions kind of festered, the more unanswered they went, the more uncertainty and tension this, this uh, created, the more 
uh, potential infighting we were beginning to see. So the rationale, the initial rationale uh, behind the 2020 amendments to the Constitution launched in January, if we look at th those first amendments, they uh, did not, they didn't say anything about a reset, although that question was raised a lot. Uh, initially, they were about uh, strengthening the, um, as, as, as Putin saw it, strengthening certain areas of government, like bolstering parliament, bolstering uh, the role of the prime minister, uh, enshrining a state council. All of these things uh, were seen as, um, given that everybody was already thinking about what's Putin going to do, they were already read as, okay, well, here's an answer. Putin wants to basically do like Nazarbayev did and create a role for himself outside of the presidency in order to rule forever. Um, yes, that, I think that was very much the case. I think the um, purpose in, 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 in Putin's mind uh, of these uh, changes were twofold. One was to precisely create options for himself so that he could stay um, if he chose to do so in uh, 2024, if, in other words, he failed to find a successor and this became the best uh, option for him. Um, but also to uh, preserve what he saw as his legacy, to preserve and enshrine um, a government that he felt he had built in his own image, a government that he, on some levels, believed was democratic, but a government that you know, first and foremost, in his mind, to preserve that democracy, it needs stability, it needs sovereignty. So we had the, uh, and we, we given, given how often Putin talks about this, I think it's very important, um, the, uh, the, the, the changes that um, basically protect Russian sovereignty and uh, defend it from potential um, separatism. In other words, making it uh, so, that, uh, so that Russia, the Kremlin doesn't lose um, future territories. You know, it's a question of why uh, he fears that so much, but that's uh, that, 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 that's another issue. Um, so um, those I mean, that that's that's basically that, that that's basically those twofold uh, like twofold purpose of um, um, these um, amendments. It's interesting that um, in the course of creating these options, in the course of building uh, democratic institutions as uh, he sees them, um, what came across in these amendments, but in his previous behavior as well, is his particular view of, uh, now he might see himself as a Democrat, the question is, does he see Russians as a democratic people? And uh, this is the key interesting thing, that the Kremlin, um, it might prize what it sees as democracy, but in its, it's in its own mind, it's more, more akin to pluralism. It just feels that Russian institutions and the Russian people are not yet ready to, for the kind of, real solid democracy that Putin envisions. It's a very unfortunate view because it's, it's just simply not, not, uh, not true, but it's also, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's self-sabotaging if you're trying to build a democracy and yet you don't believe the people that you govern are capable of it, uh, you're not really going to achieve a lot. But nevertheless, this is a view that's widely, that has been widely expressed by people close to Putin um, it's a view that ha has been ascribed to Putin. Now, it's, it's a question to what extent it has evolved, um, but I think it's a very widespread um, idea. Uh, not a very helpful one, but, uh, but there nevertheless. Um, so, and that in, in a way explains why there's this need to bolster, to cement, to strengthen stability, uh, precisely because we need, we're, if we're thinking about long term, we're going to need these institutions to be very, very solid. We're, we need to first establish the dictatorship of the law uh, before we really get to anything else. Um, but of course, at the same time, the grantor of all of that is Putin. And if he cannot uh, find a way to remain in power uh, beyond 2024, then this whole experiment in democracy can, in his mind, um, fall apart. 
Now, I think that was the, I suppose that was the picture in, 20, uh, in, in January 2020. Um, February, March, uh, things started to change. Um, we had a new, a, a huge new crisis that, that, that nobody was prepared for, COVID-19. Um, and uh, initially what we saw uh, was a very interesting reaction. Uh, the Kremlin was among the first countries to actually implement a robust response. On January 30th, they closed the border with China. Um, in March, they uh, placed restriction, restrictions on travel. Um, Moscow Mayor Sergei Sabanyan uh, started implementing a lockdown. Um, he became kind of at the forefront of, of, um, of Russia's COVID response, uh, and he took on, he took a pretty draconian um, approach. A very uh, people close to him have uh, described it as an Asian approach, a very a very very autocratic one. Um, that approach was later discarded. Uh, the Kremlin uh, began to fear that uh, the economic uh, consequences um, of dealing with the pandemic were something that were far scarier than the pandemic itself. Um, they were so afraid of this economic impact that this stopped them precisely from doing what something that could have actually helped mitigate the economic risks. In other words, spending its um, pretty substantial reserves. Uh, the Kremlin was loath to do so. Uh, at the same time, uh, a draconian lockdown was not something that they could afford. And in these scissors, in this um, situation of indecision, what Putin basically did was he delegated decisions to regional leaders. Um, and uh, Increasingly, uh, we saw Sabanian pressured to abandon his uh, uh, lockdown uh, response, basically lift the lockdown far earlier than uh, he was prepared to do so or anybody else. Again, this was largely based on fears of or fears for the economy. Um, now, this is interesting because if we, if we look back, if, 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 you know, if I'm going to posit that Putin believes in some semblance of he sees himself as a democrat or as democracy something that he strives towards here is more yet more evidence of that if we notice at look at how the kremlin responds to popular uh ratings to popular protest what emerges is almost a preoccupation with ratings um Putin has, uh, and if, if, we, if we look at the way ratings are reported, give, given, given the interest in, how, in, in Putin's approval, approval ratings, this suggests this is something the Kremlin watches closely. Uh, the presidential administration operates with KPIs for uh, regional leaders. And among the, the, the main uh, KPIs is public content. In other words, if you've got a protest rally that directly speaks to the inefficiency of the regional leader. Uh, in some in some very altered, manipulated way, this is in a sense a reflection of the need for legitimation from the people. Um, and that was, I think, the main reason why this vote, which was ultimately, th these amendments could have easily been passed by parliament, needed to be put up to a popular vote, which is in fact what was done in order to give it that legitimacy that Putin so um, uh, seeks. Um, but in the course of uh, the, 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 the COVID crisis, one more very, very, very crucial thing emerged, which basically dashed whatever initial ideas uh, for creating options or bolstering democracy that this could have, this could have had. Uh, the Kremlin under its own admission, changed its mind, Putin changed his mind under the impact of COVID and uh, decided to go ahead uh, and reset the term limits. Precisely something that he precisely had denied uh, that he was going to do and yet went ahead and did so anyway. Now, I'm 
don't really, I'm having a really hard time believing that if this was his plan all along, then why deny it? I really generally think that Putin is an individual who is very prone to changing his mind, who's, who, who tends to adapt, who tends to prioritize flexibility. Um, and this was indeed a case of uh, him feeling that if the economy is under such dire threat uh, and the uh, effect of uh, an economic crisis is public discontent, something that he fears a lot more than is often warranted, again, that places an, an extra premium on stability. And basically he said as much. Uh, his uh, decision, uh, as he explained it, was the need to um, avoid the kind of um, tension, uh, 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 debates and uh, competition as people darted uh, and looked for a successor. Uh, given the experience of 2008, uh, when the questions about successorship really did lead to um, infighting, I think this was a genuine concern. He didn't want to appear as a, uh, as a lame duck, so basically he wanted to uh, cut out the questions and cut out the uh, suspicion that he was going to step down, ensure that everybody thinks he's staying on, uh, and then he can, of course, decide um, uh, what he's actually going to do in 2024. So I think that is as far as intent goes. Now, the second question is effect. And again, we can't predict, but the thing about uh, trying to achieve democracy uh, in any way possible is that it has a pretty unfortunate quality of actually achieving the opposite effect. If everybody thinks that Putin is staying in power, then the alternatives are uh, even less likely than they are now. In other words, by uh, creating the impression that he's going to stay in power, he very likely will. Um, he is uh, perhaps subconsciously uh, indeed ensuring that there is no competition. And if there's no comp competition, uh, there's no likelihood for a strong successor um, who could take his place. So in other words, what we're seeing is in very many ways a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, it's almost an Oedipal story of, uh, you know, if you're trying to avoid the, uh, your, your uh, uh, prescribed fate, you're actually, by, by your own actions, you're making it happen. Um, so I think that is where we are uh, today, in a way, um, by having to impose this this referendum with the kind of rigging that we saw. Uh, it, 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 it kind of it 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 underscores a certain desperation in um, in, in terms of the need to uh, legitimate this this democratic vision, uh, but in a way that. Uh, basically leaves very few illusions about what this actually is. Um, what that's going to create, what I think that's already creating, is uh, increasing tensions among the elites. In other words, if the, if the, uh, if the aim was stability, then the, um, the effect might well be further questions, the effect might be further uh, public discontent, but I think we'll see. Now, uh, I do want to stress, however, I'm not seeing, I, intuitively speaking, I do not see a likelihood of mass discontent. All of these things that I've described, they're not good. Um, they have some good aspects, but uh, on the whole, whole, they're not conducive to the kind of priorities that Putin, as I believe, thinks he has. Um, at the same time, I don't think they're going to bring about any sort of massive collapse or uh, an existential threat to the Kremlin. I think that gradually speaking, we're seeing two tendencies in society, the maturing of civil society, and on the other hand, the strengthening of government institutions. Now, that's not very democratic, but nevertheless, there is a benefit to this kind of stability to allow uh, civil society to grow, uh, to learn how to negotiate, to learn how to achieve um, uh, to achieve what it wants on a local level. And very, very gradually, we might see changes, positive changes down the line. And I think on that positive note, I would like to stop. And uh, I'll be very happy to take your questions. Sure. Thank you, Anna.
I would just add a couple of words, basically, that um, uh, just as I said in the beginning, that uh, the uh, amendments were promoted and kind of marketed in a, in a form that uh, kind of it wasn't only about Putin and his like, you know, concentration of power around him, but it's something that he wanted to show as a, you know, a big, enormous change to the constitution where he brought uh, like a notion kind of, uh, uh, let's say the sentence that uh, the minimum wage shouldn't be like uh, lower than the living wage kind of the, the as well as uh, you know the there should be there shouldn't be gay marriages or uh, there is a first time that God is mentioned in constitution as well so there are like many changes as well in this term which was kind of packaged in a way uh, this kind of the, uh, the, the the first and foremost thing that um, dealt with the Putin's power that it was something uh, like small part of it so he basically gave an offer that many Russians like uh, uh, normal kind of people wouldn't uh, like wouldn't have refused because I mean uh, pensioners want more pensions like indexed pensions right with the inflation so they they were like it was used quite uh, in a like marketing way as well to say uh, for me uh, and I will use my uh, this opportunity to say I mean to ask the first question uh, basically that. Um, as I saw, there is also a kind of the, a division of, uh, let's say, the spheres will be uh, kept in terms of the uh, president can uh, still um, will still be, let's say, coordinating the uh, security policies like the foreign affairs. So, is that something that? Uh, and I'm asking in the context of South Caucasus because people here mainly believe that um, you know ultimately the changes. Uh, in the power in Russia will lead, uh, I mean, if, if, if best case scenario, that there will be some changes as well in the policies of, uh, let's say, um, in relations of Russia's relations with other countries in South Caucasus, especially in Georgia, in terms of, um, in the in the in the, conf in the co context of conflicts, the unresolved conflicts. So the thing is, still, it now institutionalizes, let's say, the. Uh, form that president still will be uh, kind of the coordinating these policies, the security, the foreign affairs, and many things. And it's not only about that, even though the state do not like this idea that uh, they can now uh, not only approve, but they can also uh, kind of nominate and uh, that they are on, on the forefront of um, kind of <clears throat> appointing the ministers. In many areas, still the president is institutionally now more uh, strengthened in this area. So my question is, how would that affect also the uh, Russia's relations in the future with uh, post-Soviet uh, countries? Is there any kind of changes in, in this institutional level, in these constitutional changes? Or, uh, as you said, uh, we still have to wait and see how the uh, fluidity, let's say, of Putin's mind will go on because um, you argue that uh, he's very flexible and he kind of adapts to reality and he might uh, decide at the very last moment how to proceed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, for, first of all, I just wanted to say a few things about these other um, amendments um, yeah. that, uh, you know, like enshrining uh, God and the marriage of marriage is a union between men and a man and a woman, um, the indexation, indexation of pension. I mean, these are cl quite clearly very populist moves. Uh, I don't think they're just window dressing. I think it is, uh, you know, on Putin's part, a genuine need. Again, if, if he sees this as, as a certain democratic move, he wants to be popular. He wants to be liked. He wants to give something back to the people. Um, at the same time, we had a there was a whole commission that was uh, churning out these um, amendments, and there was a lot of them. And uh, I think the, the, the point of that was in some ways also to placate uh, certain sections of the government, certain sections of the elite, uh, so that they would be happy and also get what they want. And that way, we get to kind of push this through um, uh, much easier. Now, in terms of uh, how is this going to affect um, relations with uh, foreign countries, 
Um, I think that right now uh, the pressure is so big to focus on the uh, the first the primary effects of the crisis that relations with foreign states is not even something that's being highly prioritized. I really don't see this translating into the kind of aggressive behavior uh, that some have feared in the past. I think that in the last several years, uh, we've seen actually a much more demure um, risk-averse Kremlin. Uh, and risk-averseness, I think, is something that uh, is characteristic of Putin. And I think this is a trait that he's returned to. Um, and I think this is something that he especially returns to um, in times of crisis. Um, now, if you look at uh, the relations with um, Ukraine, uh, they've basically stagnated where the Kremlin is sitting there waiting for uh, Minsk to be implemented by um, somebody else. Um, if you look at the uh, change in government in Armenia in 2018, again, this was something that the Kremlin was not even threatened enough by to uh, really even seek to interfere and respond to in any, um, in any, in any uh, substantial way. So I think that um, what Russia's foreign policy is, especially in the near abroad, is going to look like is that it really responds to threats or things that it perceives as threats. And in the absence of those, um, we might not really see a lot happening in, in, in the near to midterm. Um, because I think that there isn't really a clear cut game plan or overarching strategy of things that Russia wants to achieve in the near abroad, um, aside perhaps from the Eurasian Economic Union, but that's, you know, um, sputtering along uh, at its own pace, uh, kind of not really, you know, Moscow would, might want it to be more than it is, but it's content to, uh, it's content with what it's got. Um, so I don't really see a very eventful uh, foreign policy uh, for the Kremlin in the in the near to midterm. Primarily, I think because of uh, because of the of the crisis, but also because of the sense of um, weariness with uh, foreign adventurism. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I urge our um, listeners, participants, to. Uh, ask questions or basically if somebody wants to ask questions uh, so they can raise hand or write in the chat and I will be happy to read it out loud. Uh, is there any? Because I've got um, another question for you, if I may. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, putting before the uh, the constitutional changes uh, spoke about the elite that uh, uh, without these changes um, this elite would kind of cease to uh, let's say um, work in an organized way and um, uh, he would start to kind of the search for a successor let's say um, how do you think that after this um, change and you, you thought that uh, there were there was a fatigue there was also um, kind of um, um, the, 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 the liberal part of the elite wasn't much it wasn't very happy how do you think this kind of the relations will uh, continue uh, in a way that uh, which kind of uh, what this uh, form of uh, cooperation between him and the elite would look like after these uh, changes well, it's, it's, it's tricky because, you know, on the one hand, one would think that there's got to be a certain sense of relief that, okay, now, now we know, um, yeah. now we know that he's staying. But on the other hand, if there's a sense that the amount of effort that went into ensuring a, a successful popular vote uh, and if there's a certain sense of like 
disingenuousness about the whole thing, that can raise tensions and insecurity. Um, I think that one of the perennial problems for the Kremlin is that in seeking to legitimate and going uh, kind of almost going overboard in seeking to legitimate something, uh, they wind up actually creating far more questions about the legitimacy of that thing than, than necessarily warrants. And when you've got questions, when you've got insecurity, then if you're not asking questions about a successorship, then you are asking questions of, okay, well, how secure is, is uh, how secure are we in, uh, for instance, in the face of uh, uh, the pandemic, in the face of uh, the economic crisis, in the face of um, public discontent? And uh, you're, you're gonna still see some kind of competition, uh, not around pick me for successor, or pick this guy for successor, or here, uh, let me uh, <clears throat> remind you of my existence. But you're gonna, you're, you're gonna see people um, trying to use the uh, persisting uncertainty to promote their own pet theories or lobbying projects or projects in general. Um, and that's going to create a sense of competition and tension. Um, so I think that's that's where, that's that's something we, we, that we might be um, headed for. We're, we've got a situation where on the one hand, everything really is consolidated around one man and everybody really addresses their um, policies towards him. But at the same time, you've got this continued marketplace of policies of people like vying with each other to promote their ideas. And another factor is, you know, if we're talking about economic insecurity, you've got basically different branches of government competing for a smaller piece of the pie. Um, so there is potentially, there's, there's potential of tensions coming from the, coming from that, from that kind of uncertainty. Sure. Um, just to um, kind of discuss also beyond um, uh, these uh, uh, constitutional amendments, you spoke uh, a lot, you mentioned a lot the uh, economic effects of the pandemic on Russia and how actually this calculus uh, was important in putting like decision that uh, this can be viable. Uh, just beyond, to go beyond these constitutional changes, uh, uh, have you seen the kind of any uh, plans or strategy of Russia to mitigate this economic, uh, uh, let's say, crisis? And um, if there are any kind of uh, plans, uh, how basically Putin himself uh, is, is thinking how to come out of this uh, crisis, especially when we saw a couple of months ago that uh, the futures on oil was uh, kind of uh, beyond the negative. So uh, the oil prices was in a shock for sure for some time. It was, I think, in March or April. Uh, so what is the plan, actually, if you know, if you have uh, kind of analyzed or heard of this uh, in an economic uh, way? Um, I mean, seeing think two things happen during the height of the pandemic during when everybody was in lockdown, um, what the government w did, I mean, stimulus package really amounted to uh, tax breaks and credit breaks for businesses. There were some minimal um, subsidies to small businesses based on the number of workers they had. Um, again, this was very much, this burden was very much placed on uh, regional administrations without really giving them either the financial or administrative resources to implement this. Again, in the hopes that region, regional leaders would uh, try to, would be motivated by ensuring public uh, content and would find a way out of this conundrum on their own somehow. Uh, that's actually creating a, a, an interesting um, and I'd say rather unprecedented uh, shift. Uh, you know, in, in, in other words, we're seeing actually regional leaders 
uh, given more responsibilities without actually giving more power. But the effect has been that they're, um, that people now look to them more than they do to the federal center. Uh, there's been some even, uh, like gen generally speaking, uh, Putin has occupied the, the most popular um, role in, 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 in government. That is now starting to, uh, some opinion polls suggest that those numbers are starting to kind of actually shift in favor of regional leaders, which is a very interesting development. So, um, now that, so uh, that, that's basically the strategy, basically uh, cut, Costs. I mean, it, you know, not, not costs, basically use use tax breaks and loan breaks um, to ease the financial burden on its citizens, but also avoid uh, any sort of substantial influx into the economy because they are scared to death of inflation. Yeah. yeah. Um. Thanks. Um. Just to go back to the actually uh, the constitutional changes. Um, I mean, basically, we saw in the news, I mean, in, in some of the uh, Western uh, kind of uh, um, news that uh, the constitutional, uh, like new constitution was even pr was printed even before the kind of the referendum, new constitution, like as I said, that physically was printed. So with this new changes, even before the referendum. Um, so and um, actually, during the referendum day, on the referendum day, uh, in St. Petersburg and Moscow, the alternative exit polls show different picture. So is that the, in those big towns still people, people do not um, kind of, um, the, the huge number of the population of those towns are against, let's say, of the proposed changes. Do you expect maybe uh, that uh, there could be something a uh, new wave of uh, protests starting uh, in the future, near, in near future, or, uh, and as you said, uh, you mentioned uh, in your article uh, that uh, Putin has also learned from 2011's experience. So if, if there are any kind of ways that civil society, what is left there, um, can somehow self-organize and act against these uh, changes. Um. I mean, it, 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 it was indeed striking to see that uh, based on exit polls, the, the uh, overwhelming response in Moscow and St. Petersburg was against um, the referendum, the, uh, the changes. Um, it was also pretty obvious that uh, the way that the changes were drafted, uh, the way the amendments were worded, showed that they were basically rushed through Parliament uh, to you know, just get this, get this past Parliament as fast as possible. Uh, which actually impacted the the way that these uh, amendments were formulated, um, and given given how the extent to which the Kremlin went to raise to lift lockdown early in order to have this referendum, um, just showed how 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 quickly it wanted to to, uh, to make it happen. Now the interesting thing is that you know if we had a, a, a a protest rally in Moscow and St. Petersburg on the day of the vote, um, it wasn't really a big one. And I, I feel like right now, uh, when people are still coming out, coming out of lockdown, people are still worried about COVID, this really isn't the time to protest. And I think this is one of the, maybe one of the calculations is that uh, this is just not, um, uh, people, people really aren't going to do anything about it, nor is there any, really any sense that, you know, it was, Pretty much, uh, the, the, the sense was when when people voted was that okay, we know what this is about. Yeah. This is all pretty obvious. We're just going to say no. The opposition didn't really offer any kind of unified um, uh, campaign uh, to oppose this. Uh, and I think that if we, if you know, once we're getting out of the uh, pandemic. Uh, it's not, this isn't going to be something that, oh, and by the way, let's go and protest for something that happened uh, three, four months ago. It's not, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think that protests in Russia, uh, they take place around a certain event, an election, um, an arrest, um, a sense of injustice. Now, there, there's got to be something. There's got to be some kind of thing that happened that people are going to want to um, dispute. 
uh, that's what happened last summer with the municipal elections in Moscow. That's what happened with um, the arrest of uh, Ivan Golunov. Uh, that's what happened with the uh, sentencing today of the journalist Prokopiva. Uh, when uh, these are events seen as injustices, they mobilize a response. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, actually, in recent years, if you look at these protests that are uh, centered not around some kind of general um, existential uh, Putin uh, Putin must go, but around a uh, very specific uh, release this particular person or um, in, in Yekaterinburg last summer there were protests to um, uh, keep uh, authorities from building a church on a public square. Um, those, those were met with success. Um, there is an increasing scope of success for these sort of activities um, that shows that civil society is uh, increasingly having a voice. It, it, it's gotten increasingly savvy at uh, negotiating its demands and not just protesting, but actually uh, going to the specific authorities that they feel have the leverage to, to, ch to change something. In other words, this is a very uh, this is a very positive um, step. So I think the, the changing nature of protests is that they're not, uh, rather than being around this some kind of huge, general, uh, cross-country existential thing, they're about specific things. And um, if uh, you know, if we're going to, if we're entering into an economic crisis, then we're, we are, I think, going to see an increase in these specific protests centered around wages, perhaps at a certain plant or in a certain city, um, certain uh, sectors of uh, the workforce protesting, uh, maybe calling for more of a stimulus, um, that sort of thing. Um, that we can see, we may see an increase of. In and of themselves, protests like that do not necessarily mean that anything threatening or bad is going on. In some ways, they're, they are actually a healthy display um, of a civil society that, that has increasing agency, that has increasing abilities to affect change. Um, the question is, how does the Kremlin respond to these protests? And that is where we're going to, that, that, that really depends on how they respond, because if they overreact, that could fuel further discontent that then is um, less benign. Um, but so far, we've been seeing a Kremlin that if uh, last Moscow protests um, are any indication, there's a tendency to both overreact and then make concessions. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. So as though the Kremlin really does not want to use too much force, and yet it is far more scared of popular protests than is actually warranted. So they're not quite sure how to respond. Uh, which is, in, in other words, a lot lies in precisely how the Kremlin chooses to respond to them. Uh, well, thank you, Anna. Um, it was very interesting, basically. That's our one hour, as I see. And um, no, I mean, the discussions like this uh, is very important, especially in the context of the Georgian society, because here Russia is discussed usually uh, only on emotional basis. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting for us always to get a deeper insight what's happening there, uh, how domestic policies uh, can influence Russia's behavior vis-a-vis uh, -vis its very broad, how they see it, uh, as well as purely on the, um, on the country itself as a neighbor uh, of Georgia. And uh, obviously, in the context of um, the ongoing uh, Russia's um, uh, occupation, yeah, here a lot of people use the word uh, deoccupation, but nobody uh, really go beyond this. Uh, in terms of the uh, people don't know much what's happening in Moscow, uh, even though, as I said, Russia can be, I mean, the topics related to Russia can be in Georgian media is one of the top interests. Uh, Unfortunately, as I said, it's uh, discussed on an emotional basis as well as on the very, um, very light media kind of basis. So on the academic level or on the discussion level, it's not um, so deep in our case. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for that. Thank you for providing your analysis.
which is very valuable and uh, as I said uh, to all participants and uh, I'll you know, say again uh, look into honest articles they're very interesting also Putin's mystic very interesting book but very interesting book so uh, which I recommend and um, thanks to Anna and um, I hope that we will meet uh, in physical uh, in like physical space uh, again pretty soon when this pandemic is over and kind of the, have the uh, more interesting discussion as well in Tbilisi in our office. Thank you so much. Um, and um, this was our discussion with Anna. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. It was it was a pleasure. Uh, very interesting uh, to address your questions, and I'm I'm really glad that. Uh, and thank you for the kind words. This was really interesting. I do hope that we can meet uh, once this is all over physically. Yeah. And I'd love to be in Georgia. Never been so. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. All Thanks. the best. All the best. Bye bye.